Thank you, Kathy. We have a quorum, so we shall proceed. Um, would you all please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I will ask Trustee Reynolds to please lead us today. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. item of business before uh, we get to our first presentation uh, allow me to give us all a little bit of background um, signage specifically wayfinding signs um, Riverside needs to showcase the unique legacy of our national historic landmark community we all believe that we've all endeavored to do that signs highlight the location of Riverside and signs increase awareness of where Riverside is We've all seen the signs on the interstate highways, the brown wayfinding signs that identify cultural uh, institutions, um, tourist attractions, historic places. Never seen one with uh, Riverside's name on it until this past week. Um, Riverside through the years has, has made many overtures to various government agencies, to the uh, Illinois Department of Transportation and others seeking a brown wayfinding sign to recognize us for what we are, a National Historic Landmark Community. We've always been met with a simple answer, no. Um, basically, uh, it, it, they, they put you, they've always put us in what I've referred to as a catch-22 situation. We don't qualify under the Federal Highway and the IDOT rules because we're too small. We don't draw enough visitors to the village, so we're too small. But you can't get any more traffic or visitors unless you have a sign. So they've put us in a, in a no-win situation, and I really was getting frustrated with that. Um, so in a meeting with uh, Senator Martin Sandoval, I mentioned this dilemma we're having, and um, uh, lo and behold, you're looking at the sign that was a direct result of inter his intervention on, on our behalf. We have uh, four of these signs that are placed on the Stevenson Expressway. Um, one each on northbound and southbound uh, Stevenson by Harlem Avenue, which is exit 283. So as you approach Harlem Avenue from either direction, the sign says historic, historic Riverside, exit 283. When you exit on the ramp from both southbound and northbound uh, uh, Stevenson at Harlem, you see that sign there. Obviously, the arrow points the other direction when you're at the other exit, but uh, it gives the direction that we, we deserve, the historic marker for the village of Riverside. Those signs were installed last week. Um, uh, the senator and I went out there and had the pleasure of um, standing among all the traffic, uh, which was sort of exciting all in and of itself, because that one's on the exit ramp. We also took some time and stood out on the inter interstate also. Um, you got another picture there, or is that just that one? There are, there, I think it's all of the same sign, but the ones on the interstate say uh, two, exit 283. So with that, that's the, the, the background, um, uh, and, and the basic background is we were never successful in getting this sign until now. So with that, I would like to call uh, our state senator, uh, Martin Sandoval, up to the podium. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I thought we were here to celebrate the signage. Um, it's great to be here. I would like to say that, you know, it's unlikely that you will find incoming state legislators who are going to represent uh, a new municipalities under a new district to really kind of take heed to uh, much what the people or the elected officials of an area would want, even before you take office. I've uh, been in office well over 15 years. I've served Cook County as a water reclamation commissioner for two terms and as, state, as a neighboring state center for 10 years. I've been trying to serve the city of Riverside, the village of Riverside for the last year, even before the primary and after the primary and continuing on through the summer and fall. And I do it because it's the right thing to do. And you know, I've had the good pleasure of meeting a number of your city councilmen led by President Gorman. I will tell you um, that over the last six months, I talk more than President Gorman than I do sometimes my wife and my spouse. <laughs> he has been tenacious over projects like, you know, uh, the river and the pond and 
as well as uh, this current project. I'd like to give kudos out to village manager Scalera and uh, my uh, partners in crime. I've uh, learned that one of your councilmen is from my old neighborhood back of the yards, uh, Trustee Sachi. I'm not uh, the my special friends. Special <laughs> friends and ancestry are from the old neighborhood and back of the yards and uh, Trustee Reynolds. I will tell you that um, because of the um, tenacity of President Gorman and some of the, and this administration, we've been able to do a number of uh, interventions uh, to maintain and improve the quality of life of the people of Riverside. And uh, that is going to be, uh, I know it's been a hallmark of President Gorman and this administration and all of you, the trustees, but uh, it's with a lot of uh, uh, pride to be able to put this sign up. You know, the signage is important. It's a, it means a lot to the, uh, the people of Riverside and it, it talks about the spirit. The historic presence of, of Riverside, the Olmsted uh, community, uh, and just the thought of, of the attempts by many other legislators in the past to get a sign up with not a lot of luck means a lot to me. Um, I like the challenge when they tell me it can't be done. You know, I prefer it that way sometimes because it brings a lot of, of motivation and it makes you dig real deep to get things done. Um, this sign is uh, a tribute to the, the goodwill and the people of the village of Riverside and uh, I am glad to now be associated and I look forward to um, more signage along Harlem Avenue and anywhere you'd like them as well as, <laughs> as, well as other signage. I have the dubious distinction of also being the chairman of the Transportation Committee in the Illinois Senate. So I'm going to work wholeheartedly with President Cullerton and uh, our Governor Pat Quinn to bring about Greater good for the village of Riverside. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for the Senator? I, I've mentioned your situation before. Senator Sandoval is running in the general election in November. He's unopposed, so he will become our state senator in January. Um, we have a real good group of state senators and state, state representatives. However, um, I do have to echo what you have said. Um, uh, sometimes I sit back and say, geez, he doesn't even represent us yet. And look at all the time he's put into this. Um, he knows it's the right thing to do. He knows you have to be an advocate for um, a, a good community and good elected officials. And I appreciate your effort. I won't necessarily talk out of school here, but when I've talked to him about the sign and I explained to him why we can't get the sign, and let me tell you, that sign, I'm shocked that it's there. Uh, his comment to me was, um, well, let's change the rules. And, and that's not exactly what he meant, but, but the point is you have, to, you have to speak up and you have to advocate, and he's done that for us. Uh, the board knows and our residents know because it's been reported in the newspaper, Senator Sandoval has played an in instrumental role in helping us achieve some of the success with the Swan Pond and Hoffman Dam project. Uh, he has spoke up directly with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources for us, so we appreciate uh, his efforts, and uh, on behalf of the Village Board, we look forward to uh, working with you now when you're not yet our senator, and in the future when you are our senator. <laughs> Trustee Reynolds? Senator, I firstly want to thank you because uh, you've made my job easier uh, dealing with the Army Corps and the IDNR. And uh, as Trustee Sachi can uh, verify, we've had times when we were at loggerheads with them, and uh, we just needed to get them to see our point of view, and especially the point of view from uh, some of our residents in, uh, in terms of tree loss uh, that was prevented. And also in getting them to see certain things in a certain way, uh, we were remarking this morning when we were traveling through uh, uh, a punch list down in Swan Pond about some of the impediments that we were flatly told could not be done. And yet here they are, and, and uh, the proof is in the pudding. So I personally want to thank you so much for your intervention on our behalf. And the senator actually, the way this discussion all started was the senator actually came out to Riverside to personally see what was going on with Swan Pond and the dam removal project. And so we happened to work this little extra. Yeah, I never realized <laughs> that I'd be dragged into the, uh, <laughs> into the Swan Pond, literally. Let <laughs> me ask for signage, but it's, uh, it's a welcome. Yeah. We, we, I always say, and, and all of our residents always say, we're special. Every community feels they're special, so I understand that. But we're special. 
And what the senator has always said to me is, you guys are special. There's not another community in Cook County that has this designation, border to border. It's not just one street, not one, one house our national landmark says. He's, he's helped us, he has helped us, he'll continue to help us um, promote, promote that. So thank you, Senator. Thank you, President Gorman. I'd just like to close and the, the trustees. You know, in my other district, we, in the last remap, many of these municipalities have had a number of legislators like for example, Berwyn, that if I've represented in the last 10 years, I've had, they went from, in the last remap, from like, you know, two legislators, a senator and a state rep, to like six or seven. Yeah, and many municipalities have, have had the same experience. You and the new remap will have, I believe, three senators. Two senators. Three reps, two senators. Three reps and two senators. I look forward, then, uh, by, this, by the time this is all over, Riverside people say we have one senator. That's Marty Sandoval. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Sandoval. Okay, we shall move on. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next on the agenda is um, public comment. Is there anybody who would like to address the board at this time? Again. Good evening. Gint, Leo Tsovininkas, 265 Northwood Road. I'm here on behalf of the uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Society of Riverside to share with you our recent activities and upcoming events. Um, our next landscape workday will take place on November 10th uh, from 9 a.m. till noon. Uh, it'll take place in, on Long Common at Big Ball Park. As always, we invite uh, all residents to come join us in uh, maintaining our beautiful landscape in the, in the village. Our last walking tour of the season will take place uh, at the end of this month on October 28th. It'll be of the south section of the village. Uh, it takes two hours and it starts at 2 p.m. Uh, we gather at the, uh, the Riverside train station. The, the cost of the tour is $10, uh, $7 for members of the Olmsted Society uh, and for seniors. Uh, the pro proceeds uh, go toward landscape preservation, educational programs, and architectural restoration in Riverside. Uh, the OMSA Society has been co-sponsoring uh, a lecture series together with the library this year, and our next installment um, will be on Sunday, December 9th at 2 o'clock at the library, entitled World's Fairs, World's Fairs Gardens. Um, this will be presented by Kathy Maloney, who is also a, uh, a member of the Olmsted Society, who has written a book on the subject, and she'll be presenting um, and describing uh, the gardens and landscapes of U.S. World's, World's Fairs uh, from 1870 through 1940, and the influence that they had on public green space and private gardens. So we invite everyone to uh, come join and uh, learn more about that subject. Uh, there'll be uh, books on sale as well as uh, a book signing by the author. And then lastly, I just wanted to uh, mention, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, proceeds that we get from walking tours and we also uh, obviously get money from our memberships and events like our, our house walks and things and, um, and, if, and, we, and we try and make use of that money. And one of the things that we did at our last uh, board meeting last month, um, we were approached by um, a, a young resident, a, an Eagle Scout candidate, uh, looking for funding for his Eagle Scout project. Uh, his project is to build uh, wood duck nests, uh, nest boxes. Uh, he is trying to increase the population of wood ducks in the area, um, and uh, this project is going to cost him about $500 uh, in materials. And the, uh, the society voted to uh, allocate uh, uh, $250 toward his project. So that is kind of an example of some of the things that we try to do and help supporting uh, conservation and other things in our, in our village. So uh, with that, um, I bid you a good evening. Thank you, Gant. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board at this time? If not, we shall continue on. Next up are reports of village officers, village president's report. Since uh, our last board meeting, which was on October 1st, I've attended uh, two CMAP uh, Chicago Metropolitan Agency for planning meetings, a regional coordinating committee meeting, and the board of directors 
meeting. October is the uh, two-year anniversary of the adoption of uh, CMAP's Go to 2040 plan, which is the plan for Northeastern Illinois. It is also the seventh anniversary of the creation of the CMAP Board of Directors by the State of Illinois Legislature. And I've had the honor of serving on that board since uh, January of 2011. Uh, at that board meeting, um, we focused on uh, progress made in implementing the GO-To 2040 plan and a discussion on strategic steps regarding transportation projects. Uh, at that meeting, the board approved the staff recommendation to advance performance-based funding for transportation projects in Illinois by requesting that IDOT form a technical advisory group to move this forward and that CMAP should initiate a regional process for developing the agency's internal prioritization and selection methodology to evaluate candidate projects. Now, why do I take time to mention that long mouthful of uh, transportation words? Because what all that talks about is basically motor fuel tax funds. Motor fuel tax funds have been allocated historically in the state of Illinois on a rigid formula. 55% downstate, 45% to metropolitan Chicago. Metropolitan Chicago drives the economy of the entire state of Illinois. Metropolitan Chicago produces the lion's share, something like 70% of motor fuel tax funds, produces the lion's share of income tax for the state of Illinois, but yet the Metropolitan Chicago receives a smaller share of motor fuel tax funds and other transportation dollars. Now, those dollars are to benefit the entire state, and that is important, but it's also necessary to recognize that if you don't support the infrastructure in Chicago, the entire state will suffer. And I don't mean Chicago but metropolitan Chicago, the entire state will suffer. So this initiative here is, to, um, is a step in trying to move away from a rigid formula-based allocation of motor fuel tax funds to um, a formula based on project need. So it's a, it's a very worthwhile project and uh, CMAP has been uh, working on this for a period of time and hoping to move it forward. Also at that meeting, CMAP uh, approved the next round of local technical assistance grants. After receiving 100 proposals, CMAP uh, has granted 46 more projects, and that's in addition to the 60 projects that are currently underway, and 15 of those are completed, and that's one of those projects that is underway is our project here in Riverside. Um, I also attended the um, Cook County Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management Town Hall meeting along with uh, Fire Chief Kamura. Uh, the purpose of that meeting was for the uh, Cook County Department of Homeland Security to let municipalities know the resources that are available to us in times of need and also training resources and other. Um, uh, Michael uh, Masters, who is the uh, director of um, this department that was brought in by President uh, Preckwinkle, is um, really seeming to do a, a really great job in getting out there, and his goal is to help municipalities. And it's our job to make sure we turn to him for that help. And I know Chief uh, Kamura and Chief Weitz will do exactly that. So with that, uh, that concludes my report, and I will turn to a village manager for his report. Thank you, Mr. President. All I have are two items. The first is to provide the board as well as the community an update on the uh, Hoffman Dam Swan Pond project. Um, they are working feverishly to complete the projects and um, anticipate completion of both uh, at the end of this week. The asphalt path is in place. They've done the hydro mulching uh, and today they were planting the trees. Uh, they've done all of the clearing. There are still a couple of items that are still outstanding that, that uh, Trustee Reynolds and Sachi, along with uh, village staff, are working to resolve and hopefully will be resolved by the end of the week as well. Um, as I told uh, 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 our village forester and our public works director when we were down there and we were talking about it, I'm very pleased with the outcome, um, as will the residents of the village, um, not only when you're walking the path, but even from the top right by the library, when you now look at across the river you can actually see into Swan Pond where as before it was blocked by a, a bunch of trees. So uh, it, invasives, my apologies. Um, but it does look very nice and uh, uh, everyone will be happy. Um, my other I item, sure. Just to clarify, when you say they're gonna complete, there's still work to be done next year. Yes, well, I mean, complete as far as most of the heavy 
um, items have been resolved. The next year we'll come back and do some, some plantings that... Um, Spring plantings have to be done. Along both sides of the of river. The river, right. In the DM vicinity. Right. The reason why they can't do that now is we're getting to that time of year where it, it, it's kind of iffy and they don't want to take the chance and, and the plant materials will have a better chance of, of surviving if they're planted in, in early spring. And so that's <coughs> when, why they're, that, that's the, 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 the delay, excuse me. Um, the other item that I have is just an acknowledgement of village staff that it's unfortunate that emergency situations um, are when you get to see the best in, in, in people. And I want to publicly acknowledge um, Chief Weitzel, Deputy Chief Cruel, Sergeant Cruel, Officer Navarro, Officer Miller, Officer Simpson, Deputy Chief Buckley, Captain Sherman, and, and all of the FD personnel who assisted with the pedestrian and train fatality that we had here last week. Um, it was amazing to see the cooperation between the departments, the railroad, as well as the railroad police in getting the matter resolved, respecting the person um, that had the accident, um, and, and following the, the proper procedures to ensure that um, the item was addressed properly. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge the efforts of those individuals for their hard work. And that is all I have. Thank you, Peter. Village, uh, Village Attorney Lance Molina. Thank you, thank you, uh, Lance. We shall move on then to the approval of the consent agenda. On the consent agenda this evening is the approval of the bills of October 15th, 2012. Approved Village Board of Trustees Executive Session Meeting Minutes of September 17, 2012 and Executive Session Meeting Minutes of October 1st, 2012. Approved Village Board of Trustees Regular Meeting Minutes of September 17, 2012. Approved Village Board of Trustees Special Budget Meeting Minutes of September 25th, 2012 and the regular meeting minutes of October 1st, 2012. And lastly, to file and review Economic Development Commission meeting minutes of September 6th, 2012. Does any trustee require an item to be removed for further discussion? If not, then I will ask for a motion and a second on the consent agenda. So moved, sir. So motion by Trustee Shevitz and a second by Trustee Reynolds. Um, Kathy, would you please call the roll? Uh, trustee Sells. Aye. Trustee Reynolds. Aye. Trustee Shevitz. Aye. Trustee Sachi. Aye. Trustee Bell. Aye. Thank you, and that motion is adopted. We shall continue on with the agenda. First up, the reports of board chairpersons, public works, transportation, and utilities, Trustee Sells. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, before I get to, to the agenda item, I, I wanted to go back to, um, to the village manager for a second. Um, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't have a chance to talk to you about this before the meeting, but I, um, I've been reading on some of the, the local blogs, and I've also had a couple of residents contact me about phone calls that people are getting with regard to uh, electrical usage. You know, uh, apparently there's one, there's one group that's operating under numerous telephone numbers that are calling our residents trying to get them to, to switch. Um, and our residents are calling back. They're getting recorded messages. And I was just, have you, have you, are you aware of this? Have people been contacting you about this? Um, I've only received a call from one individual in regards to this. And as I've told that person, um, we cannot um, ask. The, it's kind of like any sort, any other telemarketer. Um, we do. We have stressed residents to be Larry, and we've gotten the information out that Direct Energy is our provider. Um, but what I've told this individual, luckily, they did not make the switch. But we have been working with NIMEC, and NIMEC is working with our residents because there were instances, incidences where um, one of the other competitors was going door to door and had people sign a form that basically transferred them over. And NIMEC has been working with those residents who have called, at least, that we are aware of to work with them to bring them back to the direct energy. So we have contacted direct energy. They are also aware of the situation. And they have also said that if a resident contacts them, they will work with them to make the transfer back to direct energy. Um, as well as um, I have reached out to 
the one company that was going door to door and that um, company has told me that they have instructed all of their Illinois people to not come to Riverside and solicit in Riverside. I mean, I just think it's important. I mean, this, this electrical aggregation is such a good thing, but it also put a lot of sharks in the water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, and, you know, I just think it's imperative that our, that our residents understand that this decision has been made by the board for direct energy and that if they, if they didn't opt out and to decide to keep ComEd or if they, or if they haven't already chosen another provider, their provider is direct energy. Correct. And if they get these kind of calls or these kind of people come to their door, um, if they have questions, they should contact you or yes. our village staff about this. Correct. So, um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, is another happy, happier note. Um, on October, October 7th, we had the grand opening of our bicycle routes here in town. And we had uh, over 100 cyclists show up. Some actually rode their bikes down from Oak Park to take part in the, in the event. And uh, it was, so it was a big success. And there were a number of people that made it possible. And, and one person who doesn't get thanked really enough for everything that she does is Kathy Haley, our, our village manager. Uh, Kathy is the one who reached out to the Active Transportation Alliance and that spread the word for this and got a lot of people to come from, uh, from the surrounding region to the, to the bike opening. And she also got Dan's Bike Shop to come. And so Dan's Bike Shop was here doing bicycle checks. So Kathy, thank you for doing that. And, uh, and of course, I think everybody already knows the story that was really the, the Riverside Cycling Club and the Riverside Sustainability Council that pushed these routes through. So it was, all, it was very neat. The, the sun came out as if on cue for the ride to start. And uh, so everybody made it around town safe and sound. So thank you to everybody that came out on October 7th. So now to the business at hand here. Um, I have a second reading of an ordinance amending Title III, Chapter 18, Section 318.2, a tax on use or consumption of electricity of the village of Riverside. Illinois Statute 811.2 of the Illinois Municipal Code provides a municipality the authority to collect a tax from those consuming electricity within the corporate limits of Riverside. The tax bill to residents for electric is dependent upon their usage, not a percentage of the total cost of an individual bill. The tiered rates are based on the consumption of kilowatt hours used within a given month. Due to the rate being, being based on usage, tax receipts have seasonal variable, variability as well. In the summer months, electric utility tax increases based on air conditioner usage, while in the cooler months, consumption, consumption decreases. As residents begin to transition to green technologies currently available, and changes to behaviors to be green, the village can presume that the revenue derived from the electric utility tax will begin to decrease as well. Electric utility taxes are billed and collected by ComEd, then remitted to the village on the 20th of every month for the prior month's billing. Prior to 2009, the electric utility tax rates were capped. Currently, the Illinois Municipal Code allows the village to adjust the current rates to the maximum, which varies based on the respective kilowatt usage per month tier. However, on average, the increase is 5.37%. These rates were previously adjusted by the village in 2004. The ordinance before us tonight would increase the village's current electric utility tax on average by 5.37%. So that is, the, that is what's before us tonight. I oppose this um, ordinance, so I will allow someone else to make the motion. Uh, I will move. We have a motion by Trustee Shevitz. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Trustee Reynolds. Is there any further discussion? This is the second reading we discussed this at our last meeting also. Any further um, discussion? The other thing I would say is that you know, when, we, when we went through the electrical aggregation, one of, the, one of the options we had with regard to setting the aggregate rates was to basically add a, what would, in essence would have been a service charge to, to the aggregate rates. And, and we decided not to do that because we wanted to pass the maximum amount of savings along to our residents. I don't see any distinction between that and this, which is why I oppose, oppose it. Anything further? If, if not, uh, we have a motion and a second. Would you please call the roll? Trustee Sowers. No. Trustee Reynolds. Aye. Trustee Shevitz. Aye. Trustee Sutton. Aye. Trustee Valerie. No. Um, do we need a uh, fourth vote? Correct. 
No. So this motion fails. Um, is there anything further in your report, Trustee Sells? That's all I have, thank you. Next up, Public Safety, Health, and Landscape, Trustee Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. You have before you the second reading of an ordinance amending the village code of the village of Riverside, Illinois, relative to ambulance service fees. The current ambulance billing fee schedule does not reflect current market value for service delivery of emergency medical services. The fire department recently gathered and reviewed ambulance billing fee schedule data from neighboring municipalities located near the village of Riverside. As a result of this research, the current ambulance billing fee schedule needs to be adjusted to reflect current market value for the delivery of paramedic level services to the community. The proposed change to the ambulance billing fee schedule is considered to be a better reflection of the current market. At the Village of Riverside board meeting on October 1st, 2012, the Village Board of Trustees discussed the proposed ambulance billing fee schedule. During this discussion, the board decided to keep <clears throat> resident ambulance billing fee increases to a minimum. As a result, the board directed the village manager and fire chief to readjust the proposed ambulance billing fee schedule to reflect minimal increases to the resident rates and present these proposed changes at the October 15, 2012 board meeting. So I move that we adopt the attached ordinance to adjust the ambulance billing fee schedule to be implemented on January 1st, 2013. Second. So we have a motion by Trustee Reynolds and a second by Trustee Shevitz. This again is a second reading also of an ordinance. Um, as discussed at our last meeting, some changes have been made. Is there any further discussion of what is before us? You know, at the last meeting, I, I, I made a point that I, I thought that it was beneficial to our residents since we, and it happened to be at that last meeting, we awarded a $450,000 contract for our paramedic service. Last year we bought a half a million dollar ambulance. So the, the, the residents pay quite a bit for this service. And I wanted to keep the, the um, increase as, as minimal as possible and the non-resident increase to go up to cover that. And, and, I, and I appreciate what you did, but I, I do see still that the, the advanced license advanced life support number one which is the largest used by our residents you know went up 20 percent um you know i would still would like that to to be more in line with the um you know the the, the, the 50 dollars or, or to point rather than 150 dollars and and you know kicked up the non-residents to cover that differences because the the als one for for non-residents is almost as many calls as ALS one for residents. I, I, I think there could have been a way that we could have massaged that a little bit more. Um, that's what I would have liked. That's what I would like to see. I mean, I'm not gonna. Well, any, I mean, why wouldn't, if, if, why wouldn't we just ask to have a change now? I'll ask. I, I, would, I mean, I, that's, <laughs> that makes sense to me. I'd rather see the ALS resident. I mean, if you think 50 is appropriate, Joe, and uh, you know, I'm fine with going from 850 to 750, and we can boost the ALS non resident up another, another hundred dollars just to offset that if we're talking about it's, it's apples to apples. I mean, the, even the ALS non resident at, at 1200 rather than 1100 puts us kind of near the, near the middle or you know, near the upper echelon, but certainly not the highest. Um, among those, so, you know, why not? I mean, there, there, I mean, there are obviously different ways you could get to the same uh, amount. I mean, if we, if we hold our residents flat, for example, you could just raise the basic life support non-residents to 1,050, but rather than getting into actually putting dollars to it, what I would suggest, since we're supposed to be the policy maker, is just to say we want we want a structure that keeps our, our residents with no increase, and then let staff determine how best to, to split up the cost among the non-residents, basic life support and advanced life support. Yeah, I thought that's, I thought that's what we discussed at the last meeting as well, too. So I don't, that's what I, I don't believe we discussed no increase. That's, that's what I discussed. I don't know if we discussed that. I think, that's, I think if you go back and you can clarify for me the direction the staff was to limit the increase to residents. I, I don't. I mean, I agree with Joe. I mean, the I mean, I the day was right or wrong. Right. It's what we decided yeah. last meeting. Yeah. Well, so I guess the question is what direction, what direction does the consensus of the board want to give staff? I guess, 
I think we want to vote on this. I think Joe's point's well taken. I mean, you know, our residents have already paid for the ambulance and the pyramid contract. So that's that's the rationale of, of holding our residents steady and, and adjusting the non-resident costs. So that's what I would suggest is hold it flat and let staff. Why um, don't you make a motion that states that? Well, so you have a motion and a second on the floor right now, so can that be amended or? Yeah, by consensus. I mean, it does a, it's a small enough board where we don't need to do amendment motions with priority if everyone agrees we're going to. So that's my suggestion is that is that we hold the, the resident rates consistent and then we adjust the non-resident rates to generate the necessary income. The same income is proposed. Yes. So we have a provision to the uh, motion that was on the floor by Trustee Sells. Is there a, is there a second to that second. motion? A second by Trustee Valerie. Is there any discussion on the proposal that's currently on the floor? If not, would you please call the roll? Trustee Sells. And this is on the amendment, correct? This is the amendment. Aye. Trustee Ryan. Aye. Trustee Shadows. <laughs> Trustee Sadji. Aye. Thank you, and that is, that what, is go ahead. So that is adopted. So this amendment, this this will go back to staff to further revise this and present this to the board at a hopefully at our upcoming meeting. Right, it, it can be put on the consent agenda if everyone's okay with it, but it will need to come back because you do need to vote on specific numbers. So yes, but it can be part of the consent agenda. Yeah, because it's an ordinance, so we right. have to see the exact right. the exact numbers. I guess I don't. I would prefer to see it than not have it on the consent agenda. So I would prefer this to be on oh, the agenda. Oh, that's fine. I'm just saying it does need to come yeah. back, however you want it. Is. Clear on that? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Trustee Sells or Trustee Reynolds. You were up, right? Yes. Uh, you have before you now a resolution authorizing the village manager to declare a surplus, a seized 2003 Ford Taurus, and authorize the village manager to auction this vehicle via I bid. The village has declared various seized vehicles as surplus property. The seized vehicle, a 2003 Ford Taurus four-door, VIN number 1FAFP532732101130, has 142,222 miles, is in fair to good condition, and was awarded to the Village of Riverside Police Department pursuant to an Article 36 filing and needs to be auctioned in accordance with State of Illinois statute. The board has also entered into an interagency agreement with the state to use the state's online auction, IBID, to auction surplus property and to date made over $25,000 in sales. The police department routinely files vehicle seizure paperwork in accordance with the state of Illinois statute. Most seized vehicles are turned over to the Cook County Sheriff's Department for disposal as scrap material. Seized vehicles deemed to have some resale value are auctioned by the police department with any proceeds deposited per state of Illinois statute. The maintenance history of this seized vehicle is unknown. There's no alternative use for this seized vehicle, and disposal of this vehicle will clear space, and the police department plans to place this vehicle up for auction on I-Bid. So I move that we approve the resolution declaring the 2003 Ford Taurus four-door as surplus property. Second. Motion by Trustee Reynolds and a second by Trustee Shevitz. Is there any discussion on this item? Hearing none, who would you please call the roll? Trustee Sells. Aye. Trustee Reynolds. Aye. Trustee Shevitz. Aye. Trustee Sachs. Aye. Trustee Valerie. Aye. Thank you, and that resolution is adopted. <coughs> Trustee Reynolds. The next is a resolution authorizing the village manager to enter into an agreement with Essential Equipment Solutions for the purchase of personal protective equipment in the amount of $16,080. The fire department has identified one manufacturer for the replacement of personal protective equipment, PPE, that includes bunker coats and bunker pants for structural firefighting protection of the firefighters. Each firefighter, according to the NFPA standard 1851, is custom sized by the manufacturer to ensure a good fit that is vital for the proper protection of the wearer. The life expectancy of firefighting personal protective equipment, according to NFPA 1851, is five years. The Riverside Fire Department replaces gear every eight to 10 years. The fire department is requesting to replace eight sets of PPE. The department has identified one manufacturer, Lion Firefighting Apparel, that best meets the needs of our organization. 
Essential Equipment Solutions is the sole vendor for, liar, for lion firefighting apparel in our area. We have negotiated the best price for eight sets of PPE, and the proposed total purchase price is $16,080. So I move that we approve this resolution. Uh, trustee, uh, if I could just point out, because this item is an expenditure over $10,000, our code does require that um, you would, the board would need to waive the competitive bid in order to accept this price. Um, which leads me to another item which I'd, I'd like to bring up for the board to consider and, and, and if the board is okay with. Um, the state statute has the RFP requirements at 20,000 for um, items and our ordinance currently has 10,000 which is um, in this day and time is difficult and kind of slows a lot of the process um, in, in, in actually is a little bit more costlier for the village to go out to RFP to get bids for items that are, are just barely over the $10,000 threshold. So if the board um, would consider um, considering at, an, at a later meeting raising that to $20,000 um, to, to comply or, or meet the, the standard that is provided by the state, then um, staff and, and the village attorneys, because we did discuss this today, um, we would be happy to bring that back to the board to consider. So that would be on a future agenda, yeah. correct? Right. What, what, what has happened is the, um, the Illinois statutes, the municipal code, uh, or rather the statutes, used to require a formal bidding. And you have to distinguish between formal requests for bid and requests for proposals. Requests for proposals were done here, but it wasn't the formal statutory process with and so forth, but um, you, you probably would have ended up wanting to waive bids on formal bids on this anyway because you had identified a specific kind of company you wanted the material from and you just want to get the best price for it. So it's not your standard bidding situation anyway. But what what staff what, what happened is a number of years ago the, the Illinois statutes were amended to reflect the constant inflationary uh, movement of prices. And the, the bidding requirement for formal bidding was raised from 10,000 to 20,000, although municipalities can self-impose uh, more stringent bidding requirements. And that's what you currently find yourselves in. Um, so I, I hope that's not too complicated. It's a number of things, you know, to say you, you may want to raise it to give staff more flexibility. You still have to vote on everything. The question is, do you need to, to go through a formal bidding process or wait to have a motion to waive formal bidding each time or do you want to eliminate that requirement? You could still, on a case-by-case -case basis, question staff whether they looked hard enough or whether they maybe why you want them to go out for bid if you're not happy with what came back. It would still have to come before you for a bid, but you would not be under the formal bidding requirements statutorily or under your code for every so can I amend my motion to waive competitive bidding for this particular instance? Yeah, and that would be appropriate here because of your municipal code. Not required by state statute here, but your own code would require it. So in order to um, avoid violating your code, the motion should include waiving competitive bidding. All right, then I will amend my motion to uh, waive competitive bidding. I'll second that. Okay, so we have the same motion and second for this resolution, and it includes the provision to waive competitive bidding. Is there any discussion on this? particular resolution. Just just to highlight what Lance said in passing, just so the residents are clear, I mean, we did do our RFPs for this, and we received yep. Three, yep. Three, right. three potential bids, and we chose the lowest one. Correct. And that's why it's very <coughs> important to be careful. People sometimes use RFP and bidding interchangeably, and they're not. Although, in a common sense way, they, they serve the same purpose. You try to get the best price by getting com competitive uh, proposals. So if there's no further discussion on this particular resolution, would you please call the roll? Trustee Powell. Aye. Trustee Reynolds. Aye. Trustee Shadow. Aye. Trustee Fauci. Aye. Trustee Valerie. Aye. And this resolution is adopted. <coughs> Village Manager Sclair brought up the question of whether the board would like to consider raising the competitive bid limit uh, from ten to twenty thousand dollars. Is there a sense of uh, sure? Yes. What the board would like to see here. Why don't, uh, so why don't you consider the direction to uh, bring that back? <coughs> what, what we'll do is prepare it so it's um, no more stringent than what state law requires, and then you can look at that and see what you think. 
Thank you. Trustee Reynolds. Thank That's you. all I have, Mr. President. Next up, finance, personnel, and preservation. Trustee Sachi, if you don't have a problem, we have a couple of visitors in the audience here. We'll yes, I'm, these I will move that up. In, in reverse order here. Correct. So what I have this evening is a discussion item, two resolutions, and I'm going to take uh, the third item, which is the second resolution, which is a resolution to a, pro to a proposal to provide professional audit services for the village from Lauterbach and Amen LLP for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2012 through fiscal year ending December 31st, 2016. So previously, the Village Board approved contracts with Sikich LLP in 1998-2002 and an extension of those contracts for 2005 and 2006 and for fiscal years 2007 through 11. So Sikich LLP was the Village's auditor from 1998 through July of 2012. Um, and, and you have on your agenda item a uh, a five-year history of the costs involved. And um, Sikich last completed the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation police pension filing for fiscal year 2007, filed in 2008. Um, the audit for fiscal years 2010 and 11 <coughs> required single audit field work. However, a report was only required for fiscal year 2010. For fiscal years 2008 through 11, the following services were provided. An audit and comprehensive annual financial report for the village, which included the library as a component unit of the village. The library did not receive a separate report on that. And the audit for the library, the village management letter, the single audit for 2010 and 11, and the annual financial report to the state comptroller. In July of 2012, staff published a request for proposal for professional audit services for fiscal years 2012 through 16 and provided the request for proposal to nine different firms. Firms were to provide a cost summary proposal for the following services. Audit, audit and comprehensive annual financial report for the village, audit, <clears throat> audit and annual financial report for the library, the village management letter, the single audit report, the annual financial report to the state comptroller, the review of the pension fund annual reports, and the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation police pension filings. Four proposals were received from qualified firms. The total hours to be spent on the audit as quoted by these four firms ranged from 200 to 300 hours. Of these four firms, the base fee for proposal provided by Lauterbach and Amen LLP was the lowest. However, their staff will spend 275 hours on the Village of Riverside's audit. Despite increasing the scope of services provided by the auditor, the Village, the Library, and the Police Pension Fund will experience a cost savings as a whole. And you have attached to the resolution um, Lauterbach and Amons, which is a staff recommendations um, firm that we employ. You have their proposal attached here. And um, if there are any questions, I believe Ron Amon from Lauterbach and Amon is here to answer any questions that the board may have. If I might invite Mr. Amon to please step up and address the board, just tell us a little bit about your firm prior to our formally entertaining this. Sure. Good evening. My name is Ron Amon. <coughs> partners with Lauterbach and Amen. Um, our firm was founded 16 years ago um, by me and my business partner, Sherry Lauterbach, um, with the principles that we're going to provide uh, quality service um, to just local governments. And 16 year la years later, that's exactly what we still do today. Um, we work with over 400 units of government in Illinois. Um, about 50 of those are audits of municipalities, um, which is why I'm here tonight. So. Um, we still live with those principles of quality and service to local governments um, and want to continue that into the future of maintaining that as our firm space. Any questions for Mr. Naiman while he's up here? If there's not, then I, I move that the board approve the resolution 
to approve Waterbach and Amon's proposal to provide professional audit services for fiscal years 2012, ending December 31st, 2016. Second. So a motion by Trustee Sachi is second by Trustee Nari. Is there, is there any discussion? I have a question. Your proposal provides um, uh, hours that you're going to expend on this project and, mm -hmm. and rates and so forth, and then it comes up with the, the base cost of the audit. Is that the cost? Is it a fixed fee? Right. It is a fixed fee, and the hours um, obviously will fluctuate um, from what we don't know today to what we'll know in the future. Um, and it can fluctuate year to year um, based on some of the needs that the village may have as we go through the audit process. Um, it happens with all of our clients. Um, in 16 years, I can tell you, we've never changed our quota fee. Um, we won't come back to you with new GASBs, those governmental accounting standards boards that sometimes change what we're trying to do. Um, our firm also does um, a lot of things related to those SASs. They're called Statement on Auditing Standards, and those change over time. Um, our firm's philosophy is never to bill a client for any of that stuff. So hours can fluctuate, but the fee is a fixed fee from here going forward for the next five years. In addition to uh, your proposal being the low bid of the firms who did bid, um, our village staff, our finance director, our village manager recommend the, you know, the quality of your firm also. So I just want to make, make a point of saying that. So with that, if there is uh, nothing further, Kathy, would you please call the roll? Aye. Trustee Reynolds. Aye. Trustee Shevitz. Aye. Trustee Sachin. Aye. Trustee Valerie. Aye. Thank you. And that uh, item is that resolution is adopted. We look forward to working with you and your firm on, on this year's audit and the Thank audits you. in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Then I'll, since we're going backwards, I'll take the, the other resolution, which is a resolution to authorize the village manager to execute an agreement with Municipal Collection Services Incorporated to facilitate collection operations for the Riverside Police Department and the Village of Riverside. In 1996, the Police Department implemented a parking adjudication system and entered into an agreement with Municipal Collection Services Incorporated of Payless Heights, Illinois to perform collection functions for our citations that transfer to their company. MCSI collects these debts due to the Village of Riverside. In January 2011, the Village Board approved an amendment to the 1996 contract, which lowered the commission received by MCSI from 40% to 35%, and updated collection division to reflect the removal of RMI, a subcontract previously utilized by MCSI. On May 1, 2012, staff provided 90-day notice to MCSI for the cancellation of the 1996 contract. The cancellation was not due to the level of service being received, but due to the age of the contract and the recent undertaking of the local debt recovery program. Staff has discussed with MCSI the objectives of both collections and the local debt recovery program, differentiation between the collection commission on both items, and services to be provided as a whole by MCSI. In late September, MCSI provided a revised contract to the village. As part of this contract, MCSI will actively pursue the collection of outstanding debts, perform weekly updates to the Illinois Office of the Comptroller, and update payments made to MCSI and the Illinois Office of the Comptroller in the Village Citation Software, MSI. MCSI will receive a 31% commission on all items collected, except for items collected through the Local Debt Recovery Program, which will have a separate commission rate of 15%. And I believe that a representative from MCSI is here to address any questions that the board may have. If you will step up, please, and introduce yourself. Good evening, thank you. My name is Dan McDonald. I'm with MCSI, I'm the sales manager, and uh, be happy to address any questions for you. Okay, we we'll just comment that that local debt recovery program is a new state initiative by the Comptroller's Office, and, and that's part of the reason also for this, uh, this revision in the double commission rate, so. Right, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and I can explain a little bit about the Local Debt Recovery Program for, for anyone who um, 
is not familiar with it, but basically it allows debts to be submitted from a municipality to the state. And uh, should uh, a uh, individual request a tax refund um, and they have a refund coming, these debts can be offset through tax refunds. Uh, that is the majority of the, uh, the revenue stream that a municipality would see. There's also state contracts, uh, state employees, lottery winnings, but 75 to 80% of the revenue would come during your typical tax season. Um, when this program was introduced, we felt it was beneficial to embrace it rather than fight it uh, because uh, if you have these debts that are submitted uh, December 1 or January 1, they, they could be very active and they could get resolved by the state. However, after the tax season, those debts could sit dormant for nine months. So it's, a, it's really a two-pronged approach. We will continue to work those debts throughout the year. Um, uh, and we may collect on some of those debts, partial payments. Um, you know, uh, uh, this, the collection industry is kind of a tough industry to be in today because uh, the economy is, is certainly struggling. The, the hammer that we had uh, putting it on somebody's credit sometimes really has very little effect to people because uh, it's kind of a get in line, my credit's already shot. So uh, this program really does work well in the sense that um, when debts are submitted, the average tax refund is about $250 to $300. We service uh, over 60 municipalities. Many of the debts that are submitted are, are well in excess of that. They can be $1,000, $1,200, $1,500. So, if they were only going to be resolved by the state program, you would be waiting several years in order to get your money. Uh, so that does provide some leverage for us as a collection agency, because not only does it take, would it take multiple years to get that debt resolved, each time there's a $15 transaction fee that's added on by the state. So the debtor is going to pay the debt in full, and they're going to pay $15 on every transaction. So that gives us an opportunity to discuss a settlement, which, um, in all of our collection contracts, including with the village, there is a settlement percentage that allows us some leeway uh, to be able to resolve these tickets. So if we can resolve it with 80% and they can save the $15 transaction fee, sometimes that gives us a, uh, a bit of a um, negotiating component. Uh, but ultimately, these debts are gonna be submitted to the state. They have to be updated every week and there are multiple file formats. So it's, it's not a, I don't want to say it's a complex program, but it, it does take a fair amount of technical expertise. We wrote the programs to be able to manage the debt. However, we recently partnered with a company, um, Excel Technologies, and they are a data mining company. And what that provided was us to, to still offer the same rate, but provide a better match rate with the state by um, going through the data and looking and refining the data so when it has mis mismatches on names and addresses, it can, it can work that data back and, and get a better match rate. So um, I believe Elk Grove Village was one that submitted their data on their own, their technical person, and got a 15% match rate. Uh, because the village uh, of, of uh, Riverside and many of the other villages are using the MSI software, which is our sister company for the ticketing, um, the data is formatted in a certain way, so we get a little bit better match rate. We were able to get 30% for a couple of municipalities. Excel was able to get a 49% match rate for Berwyn. So clearly they have the technology to be able to get a better match rate. That better match rate equates to a higher return to the village. Um, so we tied it all together though. So we have the collection side, we have the Excel technology side, which provides the better match rate, and then that's all linked back into your MSI software. So as payments are made, we update your data records and ultimately we're providing um, uh, savings in data entry time on your ticketing software, a two-pronged approach in your collection side, and uh, which should equate to a higher return for the municipality. Okay, then I am going to move that the board approve the resolution which we have attached as the agenda item, which will enter us into an agreement with MCSI to perform collection functions of our past due citations and assist in the implementation of the local debt recovery program that's offered by the State Controller's Office. Second. So motion by Trustee Sachi is seconded by uh, Trustee Shevitz. Is there any further discussion? Mr. McDonald, just to clarify for me, um, if the debt is submitted to your firm for collection, it's subject to the 31% commission rate. If you then subsequently collect that debt through the Controller's Debt Recovery Program, 
the commission rate on that debt is then 15%. That's correct. So irrespective of any other work you may have done on that, your rate then drops to 15% because it's collected through that manner. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, just one question, procedural question. Lance, this agreement provides for signature by the village president and the resolution provides for signature by the village manager. It should be the village president. Yeah, we should push that. I didn't catch that. So we can just make that technical uh, correction so it will be signed by the village manager? No. Yeah. Uh, by the village president. So then the resolution will be amended to read the signature by the village president. Correct. Right. Okay. So we have the motion and the second on the floor. With that. This uh, change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Um, Kathy, would you please call the roll? Trustee Sauer. Aye. Trustee Ryan. Aye. Trustee Sauer. Aye. Trustee Sassy. Aye. Trustee Valens. Aye. Thank you, and that resolution is adopted. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. McDonald, and your firm for working with us on uh, this important uh, initiative for the village. Yes, my last item is a discussion item, which is a discussion of the uh, fiscal year 2013 budget of the Riverside Museum. At the September budget workshop, staff presented a balanced budget. The village board reviewed and discussed many of the adjustments within the budget. A majority of the village board requested that staff add back to the budget. $10,500 in public works building maintenance. As part of the discussion, the Village Board had questions regarding the Historical Commission's budget, fundraising, and donations. The Village Board requested clarification regarding how fundraising efforts are funded and changes for the Commission's budget as presented. And since then, staff has evaluated the Historic Commission's request and recommended changes to the Commission's budget and is presenting these items to be discussed this evening by the Board. Staff recommends that these changes be incorporated into the fiscal year 2013 budget document, which will be presented at our November meetings. Staff recommends that in addition to the budget request reduction, of $4,550 that all future costs with fundraising and non-recurring special projects be paid for from the Commission's general fund balance assignment of, as of December 31st of 2011, stood at $73,074. Historically, any and all donations made to the Museum Historical Commission were placed in a separate account within the general fund and were not drawn upon. Any fundraising expenses or exhibits that were designed based on the fundraising efforts were paid from the general fund with all the donations being added to the assignment in the general fund, which now totals that $73,074. Any museum income or program revenue would be placed in the general fund and was used to pay for the costs associated with the operations of the museum. The most recent Historical Commission financial report is attached for the board's reference. The Museum Historical Commission has a separate account and all donations received are deposited and tracked in this account. And you have the uh, revenues and expenditures, the latest figures attached, along with some history to it. So personally, I feel that, that this policy change is, is a good one that we should, that we should give our assent to. And, and I also concur with the reduction in the budget request of 17, from the original 17,000 to 12,450. I remember correctly, I thought we, I thought uh, the chairperson of the uh, Historical Commission was going to be here to explain some of these things. I don't see the need for it since, um, since she actually, I met with her and, and she has given her assent to all these items and to this policy change. Matter of fact, she thought that that's, basically, I think that whole commission and and myself included, thought that this fund, that their, that their budget actually operated sort of as an enterprise fund within the general fund. Well, to our great surprise, it does not, did not operate that way. 
And so in the, in the future, and, and some years, um, some years the Historic Commission has contributed to, the, to a general fund surplus, and some years they've detracted from it. It amounts to a few hundred dollars on average every year. So with this new policy, the village continues to support the commission and the museum's activities for their regular operating expenses. But if there's special programs or events, or if they want to run a fundraiser, then they're going to have to spend that money out of that restricted balance, not out of general fund money. That was basically the point, I believe, that you were bringing up and that Mark um, also commented on at the last board meeting. So, so, so what you're saying is out of the $12,450 that is put aside for the uh, Historical Commission, $5,400 and twenty-seven, the two in the yellow highlighter is going to be taken out of their Right. They're $73,000. If they even spend that, if they do that, yes. So what we will be basically contributing is $500 for a grant writer if needed, $3,000 for brochures, which I, I don't, what, what kind of brochures, I don't understand. That, that's their, their if, if you've been in the museum in the last few years, you'd see that they have several brochures published on various topics for visitors that wish to take a, um, a walking tour, or they have one on education, there's one on the water tower, and some of those brochures need to be updated. So, so they've been talking actually for a few years about doing that. So, and, and, then, and, and, and by the way, since um, the village is getting a new copier this year, I've explained to them that they might not even need to spend that. We can probably do that all in-house. So that's another item that probably won't get spent, even if they do get around to it. I mean, like I said, they, they talked about revising these brochures before it hadn't gotten to it. So if they do it this year, um, you know, they should wait until we get that new copy on hand, and we'll be able to do that and reduce the printing costs, not only for the historic museum, but for the village as a whole, with that new, uh, that new copier should save the village. Jessica, I believe we talked that in about five years it'll have paid for itself, right? Correct. Yeah. So in essence, what's coming out of the general fund is $4,300. That's right. I mean, I was under the impression that somebody from the Historical Commission was going to be here as well. I mean, that's what we asked for. Um, that isn't what the whole board asked for. Well, you know, Lon, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, when we're considering a commission's budget, it would be nice if they could come meet with the entire board. And, and you know, it, it, anybody can call them up anytime you want. Her phone number is 312-256-6573 and ask her anything you want. And that's the purpose of having meetings is so we have this discussion in front of our residents, well, you know, not, you know, not in private. I mean, let's face it, you guys want to just, like, uh, like prosecute her before a board or something for for uh, you know and well, I don't I don't know where that do came that. from so and, since and you're the only person here to answer what, questions let me ask you a question just call her up and ask her if you have the, a question that I can't answer the the calendar expense I thought the calendar was one of their fundraisers because they, they sell the calendars right well and they sell calendars they sell ornaments so that that historically has always come out of their budget request and then the, the money that's received from it goes back into the general fund. It doesn't go into the restricted fund. So, so shouldn't the calendar portion under this new policy be paid out of their, their no. 73000 no. no. No, only because the, that's the cost that they, the money that, or the revenue that is derived from those calendars stays within the general fund. It doesn't go into the... Now, see, that, that, that was the other part I don't really understand. Because I, if, I under, if I understood what, what Trustee Ballerin was saying last time, the thought was that if they derive income from something like the calendars or, or the ornaments, that that would go, that would inure to their benefit. That it would not go back to the general fund, that it would actually go into the museum's fund. Isn't that what we talked yeah, about last I would time? Like them, if, if, they, if they have a great calendar sales, great ornament sales, I think they should, they should, they should be able to reap the benefits of those, of those sales. I thought, the, I thought the discussion was we didn't want to swap general fund dollars 
for restricted dollars we don't do fundraising right. right we don't and and if i'm hearing this right and reading this right the three thousand dollars that's going to print the calendar and the brochures any revenue derived from that will go to from go back to the same fund from which this funding was derived which is all i care about is is if it's if it's restricted dollars are going to be generated then it should come out of the restricted fund if it's general fund dollars generated have it come out of the general fund like calendar and ornament sales, which are regularly recurring things every year, come out of their, their general fund budget request, and the revenues go back into the general fund, not into the restricted fund. See, that doesn't seem Let me, Jessica, do you want to add something to that? And then, uh, just an add on um, only items that are strictly donated, for example, the book sales, the, the, the books were actually they'll pay for the costs out of their donations, but any profit, so to speak, that is derived is going into their donations to build up the donations in the segregated account. So any income that's derived, we have program revenue and we have income um, from sales. The sales are the ornaments and the calendars. The program revenue is essentially the, the tours that they do on an ongoing basis, and that goes back into the general fund. Approximately on an annual basis, you're looking at anywhere from 1500 to 3500 that goes back into the general fund. Fluctuates based on calendar sales, on how many tours they have, and then also on the sale of the um, ornaments. That doesn't seem fair to me, to, to the Historical Commission. I mean, it seems to me that a better way to do it would be to model it kind of along the lines of what the, the Parks and Rec Department does. I mean, certainly we want to underwrite the, like the daily operating expenses, copies, phone, all that kind of thing. But if, if they generate income from their own efforts, like through ornament sales or, or from calendars, then that should go into their, into their fund. They should, they should pay those, for those things out of their fund, and then if they, if they reap a profit from those things, that profit should endure to their benefit. Yeah, but the difference is that, that Parks and Rec Department has its own tax level. Historic does not. So that, that, in my mind, that gets paid out of general tax, a mix of general tax dollars and now um, their reserves that they have. So well, they do have a tax levy. The tax levy is $4,300. I mean, we are giving them money out of the general fund. But I, I, it, it's not the tax level. this isn't, this is, this, this is, this is, well, it's, it's, still, it's still tax dollars. This is not something that to, to, I mean, I, I, I think you're, 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 you're thinking that we're trying to hamstring the, the historical commission, and, and quite frankly, it's, it's completely the opposite. I would like them to be completely, you know, they can, if they want to have, if they have a great ornament sales, great catalog sales, and they spend $2,500 and generate $5,000, I, I think they should keep the $2,500. Well, the idea was that their restricted fund would would be donations so ornament sales are not donations that's an item that they're that they are purchasing and reselling um for instance you know the book that commissioner guardi and i wrote was specified as a donation we filled out a donation form according to the village's policy so that that specifically would would accrue strictly to the restricted fund Right, but if you if you had uh, calendar sales and these 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 ornaments, if you wrapped them together with a fundraising event, the potential of making quite a bit more money for a very minimal investment, if they if if the job is done correctly, I think this is a better deal for the historical commission because then they have the opportunity to double their own money rather than take. $2,000 from us and have to give us $4,000 back. I would rather them take $2,000 from themselves and build their own restricted fund. So they take, they take the risk, the but they get the reward. Decide, it's up to the commission well, to decide, not us. It, it, this no, is, this no, is, no, it's up to us, it's to, up to, decide. us to decide because it's right in front of us. But you know, to go back to what Mark said, I, mean, I think that, that point is well taken. I mean, the, I mean yes, the, the Parks and Rec Department has a, has a tax levy, but, but but the Historical Commission has basically a subsidy, a taxpayer-funded subsidy to underwrite their operations. So, um, I mean, I, we, I understand what 
what this is suggesting, I think what Jonar is suggesting is there might be a better way that would be better for the historical commission if they were allowed to actually reap the benefits of their efforts. I mean, if they, you know, if they, if they spend, like Joe said, they spend two thousand dollars out of their out of their restricted fund, they make five thousand. They should get that profit back into their restricted fund to use on on historical museum projects. I'm, I'm confused here. Two weeks ago, Joe, you brought up the point of swapping general fund dollars for restricted dollars, and, and Ben, you agreed, and, and I agreed too. Now, I, I, it seems like you guys are okay with swapping general fund dollars for restricted dollars. That's, but that's what I'm hearing. What am I missing? Well, then, then you need to, then you need what am to I missing? Down, then you need to slow down and listen. Well, if, rather, if, rather than, than being sharp in your comment, I, I I, 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 let, let me explain. I let me explain my understanding of what he's missing. What my understanding of it, you're missing is the fact that the expense of producing the calendar or the ornament would come from donated funds. Mm -hmm. So the revenue goes back. So there, that's, that eliminates the swap. Is that correct? Exactly. Is that Joe, is that correct? Exactly. Okay. And then whatever revenue they generate from that, they can put in that restricted fund. Jessica, can you speak to how it's set up now and kind of clarify what the differences are? Well, how it's been done for at least the past 10 years essentially is any fundraising efforts were paid actually from the general fund. Um, I think the intent was that the donations would offset some of the costs borne by the general fund, but that never actually came to fruition. Um, essentially, as mentioned in the, the agenda history, it, it assisted in building up what is essentially now that $73,000 because even when they did the donation effort, those monies would then be go in that segregated account um, strictly for the historical commission and general fund monies would be expended for the exhibits and any of their special fundraisers and things of that sort. So the donations that we received went into that segregated account, but general fund money was still expended. So one of the proposals that staff has put forward here is to correct that correct. imbalance, and that was in reaction to what we talked about last week. The other item here is the reduction in the historical commission budget, and I guess that's what we're talking about right now, is it sh should it be further reduced to require that any types of um, merchandise, I guess we could say, that they want to market, they would have to pay for on their own, and they would be able to keep the revenue. That's what. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, though, I think it's important to emphasize that, that, I mean, when you say we're talking about reducing their budget, from my way of thinking, we're actually increasing their revenue. I meant from the general fund. Right. No, I understand. Yeah. I don't, but I just want, I want to be clear to folks listening that what we're talking about is a, is a, is a, 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 a procedure that by allowing them to actually reap the benefits of their efforts, they would actually be able to build their restricted fund more instead of having to go back into the general fund, which it seems to me is a much fairer and more equitable way of doing things. They make the effort, they get the profit. Yeah, and then, and, and they give a tour. I mean, do you want that to go into the restricted fund too? Yes. Yeah. Any revenue that they generate. Um, I mean, I think we should, we should you know, make sure that the, 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 historical, the historical museum is, is funded and and, and run because it's an important part of this village. But I'd like to give them the opportunity to be able to build that restricted fund to a point where they may be able to do something I mean, real big with it. I, you know, I don't know what it is, I don't know the ideas that they have, but, but at, there's gonna be a certain point in time where, where that can grow to a, to, 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 to a sizable amount, and it is, already is a sizable amount because of their efforts. Um, because of the efforts of that board and, and previous boards before. So it, it's just, I think it's just, uh, that, and that's why I, 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 I wanted Judith to be here was not to, to harass her, but to understand the printing and binding, how much of the 3,000 brochures is actual calendars, how much does she think is actual ornaments, what, what parts not. are that, what part is that, you know, what is that moving part? And I don't, I don't, I don't know that. The, the, the brochure expense was just to revise. They, they have about five or six brochures, and it's to update and revise those. And um, 
that doesn't reflect the calendar thing is separate on there. I, I don't. What is the part no, again? Really? Okay, no, it is in there. Yeah, but I don't see. It, I yeah, don't see another line that, on it. Other that than that the thing 000. is, yeah, it's right. all combined. So we don't know what three thousand. If that's three thousand brochures, or three thousand for calendars, brochures, and ornaments. That's that's what I would would like a little more understanding on. What do they spend in calendars? What do they spend in, in um, ornaments? And how do we, how do you break that out? Ornaments is separate. They, it is paid out of other supplies. It is not paid out of um, any type of printing and binding or exhibits and displays. So the, the it's it's in a separate account. But the printing and supplies. binding is three thousand. That's where the calendars come out of. Correct. Okay. So how much of that is calendars, right. um, and then the other supplies is. There is no other supplies. It's 20, uh, is, oh, other office supplies. supplies is 500. Is that where the calendars come out of? Or where the uh, ornaments come out of? No. Because um, there is no other supplies other than other supplies 2750, which have already been removed. Um, no, the 2750 is, is still there. That That's inclusive of, if you look at historically what's been spent out of other supplies that usually is due to the ornaments that are purchased. Even but, though it's not listed, it's listed as the fundraising event, that, that item is inclusive of. So we've already removed the ornaments? No, they haven't been removed. It was just the, the narrative wasn't included. But, there, but that would be paid for our restricted funds. The, the ornaments? Yeah. It depends on what the direction but that, of the I mean, that's, is. But that's what the proposal is, is the 2750. Yeah, you, have, you have the 2750 here highlighted as it's being completely removed. So is the 2750 the fundraising event or is it? 25 for the fundraising event, 250 for the ornaments. No, I, I do stand corrected. I, I don't know where she budgeted for the ornaments out of. What's the, let me just take a step back. What's the, so are we discussing the policy here or are we discussing the specific budget right now? Because we could probably clear up a lot of these questions just by talking about the policy. Because it sounds like the discussion is, do we want to keep the policy as it is listed here, or do we want to move to a policy where anything related to any sort of fundraising, be it recurring or non-recurring, come out of their um, assignment in the general fund? And then any revenue derived right. from that would be Right, it's right. dollars in, dollars out. Right. Right, right. okay, exactly. so that's, it sounds like that's the major crux of the issue, that's, right? That's what. Rather than right. get bogged down in, in these budget right. specifics. As soon as, we, they, as soon as we clear that up. They sell. I think they sell, they produce themselves out of that budget and they get the revenue from that out of that budget. Any revenue that they derive. I mean, you don't, I mean, if they go, they do tours. I mean, they, I guess they're, in, in essence, they're selling it for, but <coughs> yeah. that's the same, same issue. But what about the grant writer? So how would you deal with the grant writer? What so is, we're spending what is that for? What's the grant writer for? That, that, that's, you know, in case they would, I mean, it's not for, I mean, there's various grants that they've discussed applying for. I mean, there was even one a few weeks ago that, that I had said should be kicked over to them that went to preservation. But, you know, folks, they're not gonna get any grants because in order to get a grant, that museum has to be a lot more professional than it is. You have to have an employee, like, um, and that's one reason why a few years ago, the previous board hired someone there, and you know, which that that pro that was discontinued then after a couple years, when so uh, Gary and I'm, I'm not suggesting you take it out. I say you know you can leave it in there, but I doubt that's another thing that I don't expect to get utilized. You, you want uh, you wanted that grant writing left in the budget? Um, if they're anticipating utilizing a grant writer in the next year, I would recommend it. I don't like making budget amendments. $500. If, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, if they don't, if realistically they're not anticipating doing it, um, as I've mentioned to all department heads, don't put it in your budget. All right, so can I, can I recommend this, that, that um, it, we do a dollars in, dollars out type of policy where if it's, if it's specifically for fundraising efforts like the calendar, um, then that comes out of their budget assignment in the general fund and um, in addition to the other things that, that Jessica has highlighted on this, on this sheet in yellow, um, general operational things are, are funded as, as um, 
they have been just out of the general general fund. Okay, so, so in other words, then, what what everyone is, does everyone want to then for any items that they sell, whether they're recurring or non-recurring things, should come out of the restricted fund, and the revenues would go into the donation Correct. restricted yes. fund. Correct. I'm not, yeah, I'm not. Sure. Why we it, made it, including not including not only things they sell, but if they conduct a program which raises revenue, such as a tour. Yes. Is there a reason, Lonnie, that the word non-recurring special projects was in here? Why specifically non-recurring and not just projects or fundraising? And yes, because it, it was to differentiate between projects that they do every year, like a calendar, like the calendar sales, okay. versus things that they don't do every year, such as right. a fundraising event. But the calendar sale is a fundraising event. In essence, it is, yes. Okay, all right. I fine. mean, anything they sell is at a profit. Mm -hmm. And charges, and gets charged sales tax to the end user. Okay. So does anybody have any questions on what Trustee Chavez has just proposed? If not, um, we have consensus. I trust you agree with that, Trustee Sells? Trustee Reynolds? Sachi and yeah, Valerie, so that's all we have good. consensus to change the accounting policy, if you will, for how um, these um, fundraising activities will be accounted for. Now, that still leaves us a question of what is the budget with respect to the general funds. And we really can't determine that till we get a breakout of the calendar cost and stuff like that. I mean, it's minimal, but... Well, the budget is the $12,450 that is listed right now. Yeah, Despite that, us that, utilizing, we still have to budget the revenue and expense. I know. Just how much that comes out of the restricted Correct. Okay. Right. At the end yeah. of the year is when all the accounting behind the scenes, but we still, for all intensive purposes, have to budget the revenue and expense and whatever essentially the surplus is at the end of the year with regard to their sales would then be added on to. Less expenses. Correct. Okay. Less any extraordinary expense, not operating expense. So the budget for purposes of coming back to us in November will be the numbers that you presented us here, the 12,400. Everybody in accord with that? Okay. I think that answers the two questions. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So there, hearing uh, nothing further on that, uh, Trustee Sachi, do you have anything else to report? I do not. Moving on to uh, River Parks and Recreation, Trustee Ballerine. Um, just an update on, um, I think it was August 20th, uh, Shannon Lang came in front of us about her Girl Scouts Gold Award, the 100 trees for 100 years. Um, before I left on Thursday, I, uh, I received an email from um, her and she was up to 107 trees. Um, so that's... Uh, a wonderful progress um, and they will start I believe start to be planted in November so I, I, I you know it's wonderful that her she did it and I also you know it's it says a lot about what our our um, our employees do the help from of course Peter uh, the help from the forester the help from our public works um, I, I don't think our, our our department heads and our our employees get enough credit for all the work that they do on the side for all the different requests that they get from our residents in this village. Um, so, you know, I'm, I appreciate what Shannon did, um, but also I appreciate what uh, uh, our forester did, our public works director, and, and of course Peter did to, to help roll on. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, building planning and zoning, Trustee Sussman is absent. Do you know of any report? You know, the planning commission meeting for the council um, for lack of agenda items. So there's nothing else. Thank you. So building, uh, pu pu excuse me, public relations, economic development, and open government, Trustee Shevitz. Well, thank you. And uh, we have no need for an executive session today. So with that, I will ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. So move. We have two motions. Mm -hmm. Who wants to be second? I don't care. All right. So we'll give the motion to Trustee Ballerine, a second to Trustee Reynolds. Uh, Kathy Haley, our clerk, would you? He didn't even make it, but he'll take credit. Oh, I, well, I thought it was from Joe. Okay, I stand corrected. Sachi. Trustee Sachi is the motion. Trustee Reynolds is the second. And let's adjourn. Please call the roll. Trustee Sachi. Aye. Trustee Reynolds. Aye. Trustee Sachi. Aye. Trustee Sachi. Aye. Trustee Ballerine. Aye. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned.
Jeez, Joe, if you're, if you're starting to sound like...